tales for dark nights. She Has His Eyes by Charles Davenport Performed by Marshall Ragsdale and featuring Michelle Ragsdale Abigail was annoyed with her mother. I'm just saying it's something to consider. Testing? The newly minted Abigail Creelman applied the powder to baby Lori's peach pink butt. Rose had more than 42 years experience in navigating her eldest daughter's moods. But no one wants to think it can happen, but babies fuss. You don't notice a diaper needs changing, they fuss. You miss giving them a meal of strained peas, they fuss. The wind changes direction, they fuss. They fall down the stairs, they fuss. Abigail looked at her mother with a gunslinger's squint as she secured the huggies around her newborn's waist. Oh, you'll never let me forget that. You took a little tumble down some stairs. You seem to have turned out all right. A little disrespectful, but... Otherwise, fine. It was two floors, Ma. Dad told me. Your father, God rest his soul, was a liar. Always was. The whole gish side of the family is known for it. Corner office, he said. That's how he got me to say yes in the first place. <sighs> nice, Ma. Abigail gently took baby Lori to her crib, the mobile having been placed for maximum stimulation of baby Lori's visual senses drifted lazily in slow, counterclockwise motions, cycling an inchworm, a seahorse, and a monkey past this conversation, all seeming to say to Abigail, What? This again? I know she's your mother, but for God's sake. But I'm just worried. She's adorable, of course, but she just lays there, happy as a clam, not a peep out of her, and she just had a hefty sackful back there. I just don't want you to be sideswiped by this. Her mother waited for a response. The woman that had, without pause for reflection, asked if her little puddin, a nickname her mother had given her in fourth grade just when Abigail's self-esteem was at its most vulnerable, actually intended to keep her baby upon hearing that her daughter and Eddie were expecting. Rose had been concerned about her daughter's impossibly high standards, and how they were likely to drive her to spinsterhood and had signed off on the idea of her only daughter ever giving her a grandchild once she'd passed her 32nd year. Her mother had an unhealthy obsession with all things related to aging and what could go wrong the longer you lived. Rose had her third and last child two days after her 28th birthday. Mom, rest assured many healthy women have healthy babies well into their 40s. I know, Abby. But that Garcia woman did a report on it for Channel 4. Thank you, NBC. She interviewed that pediatrician they have on the Sunday show sometimes. Dr. Mitch, he said after 35, the risk of preterm labor increases by 20% or so. Preemies can get lung problems, digestive problems, brain bleeds, and neurological complications, including, you know... Retardation. Abigail's mother was very concerned that Lori might have some form of developmental delay. Those were not the words she used, however. The words had been... Abby, you have to be prepared if that baby is, you know... The word had not been special, or even slow, but... Retarded. And might have to be, well, out of a bit, but in a home somewhere. A home. As if her mother was some... Dickensian character, or a woman that had grown up with memories of the Great Depression rather than Creedence Clearwater Revival. I was early by less than a week, Mom. I saw the report. In fact, you emailed me the link to the website. <sighs> a healthy 40-year-old with no medical issues, in good physical shape, and who conceived naturally. 
is likely to have just as normal a pregnancy as a woman in her 30s. That's what her pediatrician told me. Oh, of course she'd say that. Her mother's hand waved, dismissing a doctor that was obviously just trying to drum up business. Rose was decidedly of the opinion that women should not be police officers, pilots, soldiers, or doctors. The, the hormones, you know? Dr. Mitch also said that after 40, that the risk of having a child with issues increases. And not by a little bit, my dear. By 30% for mothers and 50% for fathers. Edward was in his latest 40s, almost to his 50s. But Abigail was not sure exactly when that would happen. She'd asked, of course, written down his birthday and everything when they had first started getting serious, but she always lost the note somehow, and couldn't seem to remember it when called upon to do so. The number of times she'd had to inquire before would make broaching the subject again awkward at best. She also did not know such minor details as his shoe size and blood type. Mom! I don't know why you have to make everything so difficult. Would I have done it this way if she'd been planned? Of course not. I know the risks involved. Abigail turned away from her mother, putting the powder and the diapers away in that little French-style cabinet that Eddie had insisted she get. The fact is that Laurie is crawling, and just as smooth as can be. So? Oh, Dr. Mitch not mentioned that? Your granddaughter is barely two months old, and already she's getting out of that jerky phase where babies look like someone having a stroke. That comment is in poor taste, Gordon. You know your Aunt Ethel had a stroke. Great Aunt Ethel? She died when I was eleven. She was still very fond of you. Abigail had been a bit afraid when she'd first learned about her pregnancy. Not with the dogged and almost enthusiastic zeal her mother displayed, but worried still. She remembered the way her foot had tapped vigorously against the tiles of the pediatrician's office. She's following you with her eyes when you move. The young woman had displayed a confidence that bordered on aggressiveness. She does that with everybody. She's looking at you right now. Well, the fact that she's moving her head so easily is amazing in and of itself. But she knows the difference between you and others, which is also kind of incredible. Watch. The doctor had got up and walked out of the room, closing the door behind her. Abigail looked around, unsure of what was to happen next, and she'd felt Lori moving in her arms. She looked down and saw her baby staring up at her, with a look that she would later think seemed questioning. She'd smiled down into those curious little eyes, and brushed her daughter's straight locks away from her face. I don't have any answers, kiddo. Dr. Mathery walked back into the exam room, and baby Lori's head snapped away from her mother's face, and her tiny little gaze fixed on her doctor. Mathery smiled slightly and moved to her left. Lori's eyes followed her. Mathery took a quick step to her right, and the baby's gaze went along with her. You see? The muscle coordination she's showing is pretty rare. It'd be a good sign if she was holding up her own head at this stage, but she's moving it around, tracking things as they come into her view. And then there's this. Dr. Mathery had held out her arms for Abigail to give her the baby. Abigail was uncertain, and that had clearly shown on her face. Mrs. Creelman, I'm her pediatrician, and since this is my office, I am unlikely to run out the front door with her. Abigail smiled, but was still hesitant. Slowly, she'd extended her arms towards the doctor, and felt the weight of her child being taken from her. Now, walk out the door, count to fifteen. And come back in and look your daughter in the eye. What if she is looking at you? I don't think it'll be the case, but if it is, don't try and get her attention. Just stand there and wait for her to find you. Abigail had backed out of the room, wary for reasons she could not bring to the front of her brain. She stood out in the hallway and counted her eyes not leaving the closed door directly in front of her. There was an elderly woman in a wheelchair that Abigail saw only out of peripheral vision. Her labored breathing provided a counterpoint to Abigail's quickening heartbeat. At the other end, 
A tray carried by an orderly clanged to the floor, spilling multicolored pills across the tiles and pulling her focus away for just a moment. When she looked back to the door, Abigail was certain that Dr. Mathria and Lori would be gone. The whole thing a plot to take her baby and run off to God knows where in the world. Perhaps more alarming in the cocktail of emotion that coursed through her, above the panic at the thought, over the embarrassment at being so ridiculous, was the small thread of relief that she felt. Some part of her saw this as a way to be free, and it was not a part she particularly liked having. She walked back into the exam room and found Dr. Mathery still in it, and the baby still on her lap. Lori let out a short sound that was something between a gasp of recognition and a laugh. Her arm extended slightly in the direction of her mother. We would normally see that kind of parental recognition at three months. A big, um, spurt, maybe the best word for it, happens in children's brains around that time. They become more attuned to the outside world and more sensitive to changes in it. Always kind of amazing to see, but I don't think I've ever seen a baby this far along, this early. There's no way she's challenged in some way, is there? Mrs. Creelman, I've been doing this work for a very long time now. To Abigail's eye, Maythree had looked all of twenty-eight at the oldest. How she could have been doing anything a very long time was a mystery to the new mother. And I do not see this lightly. I find nothing wrong with your daughter. Quite the reverse, actually. She's quite ahead of the curve. We're ahead of the curve. What does that even mean? Rose had not been swayed by the story. What? What do you mean, what does it mean? She's perceptive, coordinated, and gifted. Ahead of her class. Somewhere close to the top, Abigail Creelman's eldest daughter had her mad stampede halted, as it was most days, by the lip of the second-to-last step. They'd just been in this house for a few months, but even at their old home, which had been a ranch with only three steps going up to the front door, Kathy had managed nine times out of ten to bang her shin or almost knock out her front teeth by snagging her toe on one step or another. Rose didn't think that Abby's oldest child was any more stupid or clumsy than the average twelve-year-old. It was, and she would never know this about herself in a conscious way, that she wanted the child to show some shame about it. Instead, her granddaughter that had more than a fair bit of gish, that famous clan of liars, in her and way too much of Abby's first husband, came in bounding into the room looking very at ease with herself, her curly red hair bouncing around her with a wide smile across her face that showed no sign whatsoever of embarrassment. Fall up the stairs again, klutz? No. Unable to hold the face for long, <laughs> Kathy broke into a laugh. Rose had wanted to be a dancer at some point in her youth, and after a few Midori hours. She'd told more than a few bartenders across resorts up and down the Mexican coast that very thing. She would tell these men that she would refer to as a Jose, regardless of the number of times they might correct her, that they should be very careful with their youth, because once they had a child, it was over. Abigail, in her own way, had been moderately gifted with strength, a certain kind of strong-featured beauty, and an easy intellectual charm. She also possessed her father's athleticism. George Gish had been battering Ram on the football field, but that was due to pure muscle and speed, rather than any finesse. His daughter would tear down the soccer pitch in ways that made the old man proud, right up until his passing. What she had never possessed was grace. She was a clomper, a thudder, and prone to injury. For that, and precious little else, Rose sort of resented her daughter. There was little of her in Abby, and even less in her oldest grandchild. She was very aware that after she passed away, there wouldn't be much left of Rose Gish in this world. At all. Go wash up. Eddie will be home soon. Okay, Mom! Kathy said at an unnecessary volume. She seemed to notice that her grandmother was there for the first time, 
and shouted a greeting at her before she lurched forward towards the bathroom, managing to just miss clipping her head on the door jam. <sighs> that girl stumbles around like a sailor on shore leave. Ma, knock it off for two seconds. Oh, Puddin, you were the same. There wasn't a single table edge in our whole house that you hadn't whacked with the side of your face. By the time you were six, another thing you get from your father. So? The apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Catherine is your spitting image. She moves like you, looks like you, and you favor your father's side. The Gishes have strong genes. Look at any photo album in the house, and every single gish or anyone with any gish in them has that same jawline, that wide nose, and those hazel eyes. Ah, that were your father's best feature, if you ask me. I don't... Well, have you looked at your baby's eyes? Mom, what are the chances I haven't looked at my own daughter's eyes? Well, then you tell me. What would you call that color? Abigail did not look towards the crib nor did she turn to face her mother. Instead, she stared at the middle distance, taking in only the mobile, with its vast menagerie of creatures as they orbited through the dust motes evident in the late afternoon sunlight. Where did we get that? She wondered to herself, and then found she could not remember. Does anyone in Eddie's family have eyes like that? Abigail looked down then at her daughter and could see her daughter inching closer to sleep with each slow blink. What would you call that color? Amber? Gold? Would you even call someone's eyes gold? Were they hazel like her own? Wait, did they look blue just then? Before she could decide, Lori's eyes closed tightly, and she began to snore ever so slightly. Well, of course they do. Who? His mother? Is she also the one where Lori gets her sweet disposition? Was his dad's side all early walkers? Because I swear that child is going to be up on two feet before you know it. Eddie doesn't talk to his parents anymore. That's why they weren't at the wedding. Why was that again? Why is it that they don't speak anymore? He doesn't like to talk about it. You know, Abby, since you two have been together, that man has been at my house or your Uncle Mike's about a dozen times or so. Fourth of July, Christmas Eve, birthdays, always brings a very nice gift, mingles and makes very nice conversation. Everyone seems to like him, but no one knows anything about him. Eddie doesn't talk about himself much. Abby felt an awkward sensation in her stomach and hoped that she wasn't starting to come down with the flu. See, that's the thing. Mike talked to him for nearly an hour last New Year's. They talked politics, religion, and even money. All the big ones you're supposed to avoid. Eddie doesn't... Eddie doesn't like to talk about politics, I'm sure. Or religion, and he almost never talks about how much he makes. Still, he and Mike talked about those very topics. You know your uncle. He always wants to chew someone's ear off about what this senator's stance is on this issue, or why we should have prayer in schools again, but nobody bites because he turns into a real bore. So he was really happy to talk to Eddie that night, and even happier that he would settle down with a man that had his head screwed on right. So? Abby massaged her lower back. Suddenly she could feel all of those hours rocking little Lori to sleep. You lean pretty far to the left, my dear. As has every man you've ever been with, up to and including Owen. Rose cocked her eyebrows slightly as she intoned the name of Kathy's father, a man that had never gotten around to popping the question because he simply didn't believe in the institution of marriage. Uncle Mike had frequently and often in front of him stated how convenient for Owen he found that particular stance was. To be fair, Abby wasn't, well, hadn't been a big believer in marriage, until she'd meet Eddie Creelman. Eddie and I don't have to agree on everything. Her eyes began to throb, and she knew a migraine was on its way. As the first pike of pain began to pierce her left eye, she hoped she'd asked Eddie to pick up some ibuprofen on the way home. I'm willing to bet it's never come up. 
and that's very unlike you, Puddin. Remember that fight we had because I thought people should be allowed to use plastic bags if they wanted to? You don't keep those things to yourself, ever. So I asked Mike what they'd talked about specifically. More accurately, I asked him what was it that Eddie had said that Mike approved of so strongly. Mom, I have to get dinner out of the oven. You know, he couldn't tell me. Just got his weird, dreamy expression on his face for a few seconds, and then admitted that he just plum couldn't recall. Oh, your Aunt Gretchen loved him. Talked his ear off at Jenny's christening, but she couldn't even tell me what they talked about. And two things I know about Gretchen is that she doesn't like anybody she hasn't known for fifteen years or more, and hasn't forgotten grocery lists from shopping she did back in 1986. That woman remembers everything. Mom, what are you getting at? Who says I'm getting at anything? How did you two meet? What? I know you've told me before, but I can't seem to remember. So tell me again. They'd met in the city near her work, of course. She'd been mad at Owen that day. They'd still been together then. Something about the water bill or some such thing. She'd gone to treat herself to a coffee at that place she liked. And then she'd met Eddie. She'd met Eddie in line while she waited for her latte. Or had it been on the way back to work? Wait. Had she gone out for a drink that night? And had she run into him then? And there it was again. That blank spot where some detail about Eddie should be, but instead was just an empty space in her mind. Abigail knew that he'd be home by 7.30 or 8 at the latest, depending on the traffic on the 5. He'd sit at the dining room table and sort bills and mail for a bit, 15 minutes or so, no more. Then he'd watch TV. Nothing in particular, he had no favorite shows that she could think of. Well, he poked around on the internet for a bit, and then he'd stretch before going to bed. The next morning, he'd be out and on his way to work before the clock struck 6.30. All this she knew, but they were all facts, events. Details of a sort, sure, but she had no idea what Eddie's favorite movie was, or if he'd had any pets as a child. She knew they must have discussed these kinds of things at some point, even if it was in the idle getting to know you stages of dating, but as she reached back, she found nothing to latch onto other than a building pressure in temples. Abby? Are you listening to me? Mom, I just... I just don't want to talk about this anymore. There is something wrong with Lori and something wrong with Eddie. I'm not saying it to hurt you, and I wish to God it wasn't true. And I can't put my finger on what it is. That's just it, Mom. You can't because there isn't anything. I'm happy. Eddie makes me happy. And Lori makes me happy. Listen, Puddin. Don't call me that. I hate it. I always have. While it was true, even Abby was taken aback by the fierceness of her anger. Other words followed then, angry and spent in a rush. At some point, the baby shifted slightly, threatening to wake, and Abby demanded that her mother leave. Eddie came home sometime after that. Abby heard the front door open and Kathy rushing down the stairs to greet her stepfather with a loud greeting proceeding in front of her. Kathy had liked Eddie right away, hadn't she? Abby wondered to herself. She'd always loved her daddy, but Eddie seemed to have effortlessly supplanted himself in the day-to-day -day role of father. The pain that had subsided since her mom had left flared briefly at these thoughts, and she had to lean against the upstairs wall a moment before she headed down to greet her husband. She woke in the middle of the night, both her husband and baby sleeping. Eddie next to her, and Lori in her crib, both gently sawed logs in near-perfect synchronicity with each other. What did we have for dinner? Abby said out loud to no one, and felt a tinge of discomfort fire off somewhere in her body. What did we talk about? Abby was suddenly and fully awake. She looked down at her husband's sleeping form, and tried to drink in every detail of his features absently rubbing her temples as she did so. With determination, she shut her eyes and tried to summon a single detail. 
Hellfire ragged behind her eyes, and her gut threatened to dislodge itself with enormous force. Gripping at her midsection, she staggered over to the crib and repeated this new ritual down at dear, sweet little Lori. She received the same results, and found herself in a heap at the front of the crib. In her mind, the competing desires to cry out and give voice to this fresh agony fought with the very real concern of waking her children. She groaned helplessly against the floor. The pain allowed no room for a rational thought to be held in her head, and did not fade quickly. So Abby lay there quite a while, her fingers gripping at the rug as though to gain some purchase and pull herself free. She rolled onto her side and tried to crawl back towards the bed. In her efforts, she heard Eddie stir, the bed creaking slightly as he sat up at the waist. Abby. As soon as Abby heard him, the pain that had been crushing downward and pinning her to the floor rolled off of her. It left with the ease of a well-loved jacket being shrugged off her shoulders. Babe. She said, now on her knees by the side of the bed. You'll wake up the baby. Propping himself up on one elbow, he turned to her with something that looked like perplexion, creasing his very pleasant face. What are you doing down there? Did you have that nightmare again? I don't... Abby started to say, but realized that she had no idea of why she was on the floor of her bedroom. What nightmare? What is he talking about? Yes, you do. You know, the one about you falling off the cliff. Yes. Abby now clearly remembered her recurring dream of falling. She remained on the floor. The desire to move did not occur to her, and Eddie hadn't offered to help her up. You've been having it for a few months now. I'm getting worried. I wish you'd see a doctor. She hated to worry Eddie, and this going on even for a couple months was too long. What's a few months of the game? Tell me, when was the first time you can remember having this dream he's talking about? The voice in her head sounded quite a bit like her mother's. She felt a brief flare of pain. Maybe he was right, and she should make an appointment. Maybe get a referral for a sleep specialist. You keep saying it's nothing, though. Waste of money to go to a doctor, you say. It is nothing, sweetie. I don't need to see anyone. Abby felt her ears and mouth begin to fill with a prickly, warm sensation. It was wonderful and relaxing. Like being on your second glass of wine while sitting in a tub that was just the right temperature. If you say so, boss lady. Eddie teased. He scooted to her side of the bed and held out his hand to her. You're going to get back into bed or just stay there the whole night? Of course she was going to get back into bed. It would make no sense to stay on the floor. Eddie had such funny ideas. In the dim light thrown off by Lori's nightlight, she could just make out the valley of his palm on that outstretched hand. She traced the contours of it, and saw there were no natural lines etched into the skin. It bunched and cured, but there was no detail to it. She felt a momentary revulsion, and she stared up at this man that she shared this bed with. The man she'd married. He is not a Tell me you can see it. He is nothing. Doing an impression of a man. Honey, everything's okay, right? There was some emotion in his voice that Abby couldn't place. Of course, honey. Everything's alright. She took his hand, his smooth, lineless hand, and slid back between the sheets next to him. Before long, Eddie was muttering, seemingly already sliding back into sleep, falling into perfect sync with the baby's own soft cooing. Abby found no such rest, as a single question rolled across her mind. We meet. How did we meet? How did we meet? How did we meet? How did we meet?
as the morning light slid in between the blinds of the bedroom, signaling that another day was beginning to stir. Abby Creelman was aware only of two things. The blood that had begun streaming down her face at some point in the night had dried to a painful coating over her upper lip. And that there were two pairs of eyes observing her. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.